So ofatumumab was approved based on its activity in patients who are fludarabine refractory and campath refractory or patients who are fludarabine refractory with bulky nodes. Um, now there's more data with ofatumumab. I wonder if Alessandra could comment on what her thoughts are on where ofatumumab fits in our toolbox of treatments for patients with CLL and, and what her thoughts are on terms of uh, tolerability of, of that agent. So in terms of the second question is the easiest one to answer. In terms of tolerability, there is a little bit more of infusion reaction with ofatumumab respect to rituximab. However, the majority of the patient can tolerate the infusion. In terms of where it fits in the treatment uh, landscape, definitely there is an advantage in uh, treating with combination of chemoimmunotherapy with ofatumumab for patients that have relapsed after rituximab therapy. I don't know whether we have solid data to show uh, that these monoclonal antibody is superior for patients that are naive, that they have not been exposed to any CD20 monoclonal antibody. So my answer is I'm not sure. I think just one point, and you alluded to this, is that if I was going to put the three anti-CD20s in an infusion reaction spectrum, ofatumumab would be here with rituximab. I mean, you mentioned it was a little bit greater, but, you know, it's not substantially, whereas Obinutuzumab would be over here. So I would say that the ofatumumab is not really, I, I don't use more caution when giving that than I would with rituximab, which I think everybody gives with impunity and without even thinking twice about the toxicity. But I, I wouldn't say that about obinutuzumab just yet. And I think, I think the same for possibly cytopenias, both neutropenia and yes. thrombocytopenia. Yes. There are data with uh, obinutuzumab causing very prolonged so thrombocytopenia more than the other two monoclonal antibodies. And the first dose of obinutuzumab is split, uh, is a split dose, which is as a standard approach, which we don't do with the other two, two antibodies. And I think that also does speak to the infusion-related reactions. I think this split dose is a pile of crap because you can get an infusion reaction 10 minutes into the reaction, and you can split the dose down to what you want, and we saw this with rituximab. Remember, we did used to do split dose on rituximab, because nobody does it anymore. So I think it's, I think it's just silliness. Well, I, on, the, on the risk of being silly, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> and so I disagree with uh, Susan on that. Um, I think giving, uh, setting out to give 100 milligrams of obinutuzumab is actually not a bad thing because if they get past 100 milligrams, they can come back uh, the next day and it's a relatively easy infusion. But oftentimes, if you set upon and have the bag filled with the entire amount of antibody, of a, a gram or what have you, and the patient has a very bad infusion reaction that forces you to stop treatment, you have to then stop the uh, therapy and obviously you have to then potentially carry it over for the next day, but it just makes it more complicated. I, I think that um, these infusion reactions can be managed and uh, it really depends on your infusion nurses. My, my full credit is to them in terms of how they manage the patient. Uh, giving the drug slowly on the first infusion after having given some glucocorticoids, watching very carefully how the patient's doing, slowing the infusion down or stopping it altogether makes a big difference. And that first day is a long day because we do stretch it out for some time, but I feel a lot more confident going forward to give it with the 100 milligrams the first day and then the remainder uh, the next day. If everything is done correctly, I think that I, I just prefer that. But Tom, that's because the infusion centers close. The patients, you, you're the one who mentioned about the patients have lives, too. They don't want to come back two days Yeah, but I row. think it's very hard. I mean, I agree with you, but this is a, uh, like some of the patients call obinutuzumab rituximab with an attitude, and I, I see that. Uh, and so I tell patients to anticipate this going into it, and uh, they brace themselves. And I say, you know, we could try to, you know, uh, we have to give it slowly, the 100 milligrams first day, and we get past this, we will be able to give all the antibody in one infusion with the next rounds. And they, I think they can accept that going forward with the first uh, couple of days being close to the infusion center. It's not a bad idea because we've had some patients develop tumor lysis syndrome type qualities even after the first infusion of 100 milligrams or so. Uh, so having that follow-up day where the patient's required to come in, to me, I welcome that so you can more closely monitor your patients. Uh, 
electrolytes and everything else with hydration. Um, One of the I think it's just, you know, in terms of my practice, I feel that this is something I prefer to do. One of the interesting features about the infusion reactions with the binutuzumab is the data, which isn't really published, but is often cited that hydrocortisone didn't seem to be as efficacious as methylprednisolone and dexamethasone in controlling the infusion reactions. And it's obviously, I think people get into habits of using hydrocortisone that they recognize this difference and actually do put that into practice. That's a very good point. I would not substitute decadron for methylprednisolone. Uh, for another reason, in terms of how much uh, steroids you have on the gastric mucosa. Uh, so methylprednisolone is the preferred uh, pre-medication regimen, I think.